It's the job of Congress to examine whether agency priorities line up with these themes and fund the department appropriately and accordingly. Unfortunately, the department's budget underwhelms and has not thoughtfully identified areas where strategic reductions could be made aside from aid to local law enforcement. I'm not advocating for arbitrary, large-scale reductions that would make the department ineffective and our country less safe. However, I do believe that robust law enforcement and strategic reductions are not conflicting goals. It just requires hard work and thoughtful prioritization. So let's examine the department's 25, uh, fiscal 25 uh, priorities. The department prioritizes combating drug trafficking and preventing overdose deaths. And you note that the uh, fentanyl epidemic accounts for some two thirds of the more than 110,000 drug overdose deaths each year. While the submission rightly highlights quote, defeating drug cartels and combating the drug poisoning epidemic in communities, quote, the budget puts a department-wide emphasis on equipping federal agents with body cameras. Drug cartels and their crime syndicates in the United States must be decimated, period. The death and devastation the cartels and gangs are inflicting on American families and bringing them to justice ought to be the department's top priority. Whether the agents doing the decimating have a camera attached to them is secondary by far. Despite this administration's best efforts to push the issue to the back burner, the Biden border crisis continues and shows no signs of stopping. People and drugs continue to flow across the southern border in blatant contravention of our laws. In an ever-evolving situation, last year, 50 times more Chinese citizens were apprehended crossing illegally from Mexico compared to two years ago. 50 times worse. When landowners attempt to protect their life and property, they end up being arrested. When will this madness stop? Perhaps when this administration takes the cuffs off law enforcement and allows them to do their job. Next, the department prioritizes combating violent crime and gun violence. In their uh, 2023 violent crime survey, the major city chiefs association noted a decrease in homicide, rape, robbery, and aggravated assault in American cities. However, these decreases were slight and the numbers remain unacceptably high. Nevertheless, I'm hopeful that this change in direction signifies a lasting about face by those who embraced the defund the police movement and vindication for those of us who decried it from the very beginning. <clears throat> With the trends for now seeming to go in the right direction, it confounds me that the department seeks to cut law enforcement assistance, including reductions to state and local law enforcement assistance grants and the state criminal alien assistance program. Another priority listed by the department is protecting national security by countering terrorism, cyber threats, and nation state threats. To that end, I will commend the National Security Division for acknowledging in their budget submission the October 7th 
terrorist attack on Israel by the terror group Hamas, noting that the attack has led to an increase in terrorism-related conduct, both domestically and overseas. Such a warning has taken on greater importance in recent weeks as chants of death to America are no longer confined to Middle Eastern capitals, but are now being heard on American streets. If such chants are not terrorism-related conduct, I tell you, it's, it's pretty close. I would like to hear if the Attorney General agrees and what action the Department might take regarding these developments, aside from issuing statements of condemnation. The Department of Justice over the last four years has picked sides when prosecuting and ultimately failed to uphold the rule of law equally and fairly when it comes to American citizens and even American businesses. It's not surprising that two phrases notably absent from the budget request are, quote, equal justice under law and, quote, respect for separation of powers, end of quote. In closing, Mr. Attorney General, where we can find agreement, uh, you will find support here. But when priorities diverge and agency actions are at odds with what we consider good government and common sense, we will respond accordingly. We recognizing uh, that you have an incredibly demanding job. I appreciate your being here today. We look forward to working with the ranking member and all members of the subcommittee to appropriately fund the important missions of the Department of Justice as this year's appropriations process moves forward. At this time, I want to recognize Mr. Cartwright for any remarks he may wish to make. Thank you, Chairman Rogers, and I'd like to echo you in welcoming Attorney General Merrick Garland back to this subcommittee to discuss the Department of Justice's fiscal year 2025 budget request. A.G. Garland, I thank you for your continued leadership at the Department of Justice for leading the men and women who work tirelessly to continue the pursuit of truth and justice. Resources provided to the Justice Department are and will continue to be under a microscope, but the mission of the Justice Department remains unchanged. I look forward to working with you to ensure we're making smart investments to keep our community safe. Just last week, FBI Director Ray was before us, and we heard about the real challenges that the FBI, along with its state, local, and tribal law enforcement partners are facing, especially in keeping deadly fentanyl off our streets. I heard him clearly. State and local law enforcement are asking for more support from the FBI, not less. And I trust that could be said for many other bureaus of the department as well. Now, further, the defense of our national security and mitigation of emerging foreign and domestic threats, including cyber, is critical. I view it as the main mission, our paramount responsibility, keeping Americans safe here in Congress, and the department's role in upholding the rule of law and preserving our democratic values for free and fair elections cannot be understated. To carry out the department's broad missions, your fiscal year 2025 budget request seeks $38.9 billion in discretionary funding, a 5% increase above the fiscal year 2024 enacted level. Your request prioritizes funding for the over 100,000 employees of the Department of Justice and makes vital increases to every federal law enforcement agency and the U.S. Attorney's offices. You have requested a strong increase for the Violence Against Women Act grants, as well as strong increases for COPS hiring grants and the Bur Burn Justice Assistance Grants formula funding for state and local law enforcement. And I look forward to working with Chairman Rogers 
and, uh, and you, uh, Attorney General Garland, on ensuring that we sustain investments that our state and local law enforcement partners rely on. Congress cannot ignore the challenges that our communities face back at home. Attorney General Garland, once again, welcome. Thank you for being here. I look forward to your testimony and working with you on ensuring that we provide what the Department of Justice needs for fiscal year 2025. Yield back, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Attorney General, you're now recognized for an opening statement. Without objection, your written statement will be entered into the record. I would ask that you try to keep your statement to five minutes or thereabouts so we can have additional time for questions from the panel. Thank you, Chairman Rogers, Ranking Member Cartwright, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. For the opportunity to discuss the Justice Department's funding requests fiscal year 2025. Since I last appeared before you, the more than 115,000 public servants who make up the Justice Department have continued to work tirelessly to fulfill our mission, to keep our country safe, to protect civil rights, and to uphold the rule of law. Over the past year, our U.S. Attorney's offices, law enforcement agents, and grant-making experts have worked together with police and community partners across the country to help drive down violent crime. We have zeroed in on the individuals and gangs responsible for the greatest violence, made critical investments in police departments to hire more officers, and dedicated resources to initiatives aimed at preventing and disrupting violence before it occurs. We have gone after the cartels responsible for trafficking deadly fentanyl into our communities and brought their leaders to justice here in the United States. We have prosecuted fraud, recovered funds stolen from American taxpayers, and challenged illegal monopolies that hurt consumers and workers. We have worked to defend the reproductive freedoms that are protected by federal law and to monitor laws and actions that infringe on those protections. We have worked to combat a disturbing spike in threats of violence against those who serve the public, against judges, police officers, members of Congress, and even against our own employees. We have worked to aggressively investigate, prosecute, and disrupt the hate crimes that not only harm individuals, but strike fear across communities. And in everything we do, we have worked to ensure the equal protection of law that is foundational to our democracy. I am proud of the work we have done, and I am deeply proud of the way the department's public servants, from our agents to our attorneys to our administrative staff, have gone about their work. They have conducted themselves in a way that would make the American people proud. But we recognize that we have so much more to do. Our fiscal year 2025 budget request reflects the difficult budget environment we are in and the extremely difficult budget choices we have had to make because of it. It also reflects the resources that we need now more than ever to continue our work. When I became Attorney General three years ago, I knew that grappling with the violent crime that surged during the pandemic would be one of the greatest challenges we would face at the Justice Department. I am glad to be able to report that last year, we saw a significant decrease in overall violent crime across the country compared to the previous year, including an over 13% decline in homicides. That is the largest one-year decline in homicides in over 30 years. And data indicates that this decline is continuing. As the Wall Street Journal reported just this week, in the first three months of this year, homicides dropped 20% across 133 cities compared to the same period last year. But I want to be very clear. There is no acceptable level of violent crime. Too many communities are still struggling, and too many people are still scared. The hard-fought progress we are seeing can easily slip away, so we must remain focused and vigilant. To continue our efforts to drive down violent crime and to help keep our country safe from a range of threats, we are seeking a total of $21 billion 
to support the efforts of the FBI, ATF, DEA, U.S. Marshal Service, and U.S. Attorney's Offices, as well as the Criminal Division and the National Security Division. We will use these resources to continue our fight against gun violence, to prosecute illegal gun traffickers and straw purchasers, and to advance, invest in advanced technological tools like ballistics analysis, firearms tracing, gun intelligence centers, and local fusion cells. We will use these resources to strengthen our work to counter both foreign and domestic terrorism. As the FBI director has testified, we are facing an increasing threat of foreign terrorism since October 7th. We will also use these resources to continue to counter the threats that the governments of Iran, Russia, China, and North Korea pose to our national security and our economic stability. And we will use these resources to continue our efforts to dismantle the global fentanyl supply chain and to break apart the cartels that are responsible for flooding poison into our communities. As we deploy our own prosecutorial and investigative resources, we also recognize that the department's partnerships have been and will continue to be some of the most powerful tools we have to battle violent crime. That is why we are seeking investments in the department's three grant-making components, the Office of Justice Programs, the Office of Community-Oriented Policing Services, and the Office of Violence Against Women. They provide direct support to community and law enforcement partners through more than 200 grant programs. Our budget requests more than $4.3 billion to support the public safety efforts of our state, local, tribal, and territorial law enforcement and community partners. Of that amount, we are requesting $2.5 billion for our COPS hiring program to support law enforcement agencies across the country in their efforts to hire full-time law enforcement professionals. And we are requesting $120.5 million as part of our new Violent Crime Reduction and Prevention Fund to fund 940 detectives at the state and local level. As I have noted before, when the Justice Department was founded in 1870, one of its principal purposes was to protect civil rights. Today, protecting the safety and the civil rights of everyone in this country remains our urgent obligation. Our budget seeks $201.3 million for the Civil Rights Division to continue its essential work, including its efforts to deter and prosecute hate crimes, to ensure constitutional policing, to enforce federal laws prohibiting discrimination in all its forms, and to protect the right of all eligible citizens to vote and to have that vote counted. The right to vote is the cornerstone of our democracy. Protecting that right also requires us to protect the citizens who, rely on, who we rely on to fairly administer voting. Our democracy cannot function if officials, workers, and volunteers who administer our elections have to fear for their lives just for doing their jobs. The Justice Department is aggressively investigating and prosecuting those who threaten election workers with violence and we will continue to do so. As I said, I am extremely proud of the department's employees who are doing the work necessary to advance the department's mission. Every day, their work brings them face to face with some of our country's greatest challenges. Every day, many of them risk their lives to protect the public. I am grateful to them. I respectively ask for your support for the President's fiscal year 2025 budget request so that we can continue our work on behalf of the American people. Thank you, Attorney General Garland. We will now proceed under the five-minute rule with questions for the witness. I will begin by recognizing myself. <clears throat> You mentioned in your testimony about being uh, 
being here last year at this time. Um, this time last year too, there were 120,000 people who died because of our inability to staunch the flow of fentanyl especially. Most recent data from CDC shows that from May 22 to May 23, for the first time in American history, over 112,000 Americans died from a drug overdose, 2,200 of those from my state of Kentucky alone. Fentanyl remains the primary driver of that increase in overdose deaths, and young Americans have been particularly hard hit. For teenagers, 84% of fatal overdoses involved fentanyl, almost all. Last week, uh, Director Ray, the FBI director, uh, was testifying here when he said that, quote, the last two years in a row, the FBI seized enough fentanyl to kill 270 million American people. There can be no doubt that a tragically high amount of narcotics are slipping through our southern border, and the border crisis created by this administration is a dream scenario for cartels. They've, got, they've never had it so good. The department's budget submission has listed combating drug trafficking and preventing overdose deaths as a top priority. With multiple agencies and components within the Department of Justice implementing strategies to counter fentanyl, how are you assuring and ensuring that agencies don't silo their intelligence and that these efforts complement rather than inhibit each other? It's a very important uh, point, Mr. Chairman. Fentanyl is the deadliest drug threat this country has ever faced, both because it's extraordinarily cheap to make, extraordinarily profitable to sell, and because how often it can be fatal. As the DEA has said in its public affairs campaign, just one pill can kill. So the Justice Department and the government as a whole has an all-government and all-department approach to this question. And you're exactly right, we have to prevent any kind of siloing. So FBI, DEA, the Marshals, OSADAF, the Criminal Division, the Civil Division, and our grants to local and state government law enforcement are all combined to work together to battle this scourge. It begins with the precursor companies in China. You can't make the fentanyl without the precursors. So we are doing everything we can. We have charged and indicted the precursor companies. The Treasury Department has sanctioned the precursor companies. The precursors then move into Mexico. We have um, then, I've personally traveled to Mexico three times. A deputy attorney general, I believe, has also traveled at least three times. Uh, other high government officials have traveled to persuade the Mexican government to put controls on the precursors and to, and to stop the precursors from coming in. In Mexico, we are working with the Mexican uh, Marines and the Mexican Army to destroy the labs and to take down the cartels, and in particular to get assistance in the extradition of the cartel members who we have indicted in the United States. We have indicted dozens of members of the Mexican cartels. We have obtained successful extraditions of people like Ovidio Guzman, who was one of the Chapitos, the son of El Chapo. We've gotten some support in bringing these people into the United States. Then the next thing that happens is exactly as you say, it crosses our southern border. As uh, the um, um, uh, Secretary of Homeland Security has testified, most of this comes through the ports of entry crossing the border. And what's necessary at that point is for more money for the Department of Homeland Security 
I hate to be here asking for money for another department, but if we're going to stop money, uh, uh, fentanyl from coming in, they need the large x-ray machines, the fast x-ray machines that can look at these trucks and these uh, car, uh, SUVs uh, and these passenger uh, cars as they come across the border. Then FBI picks uh, and DEA in the United States picks up the traffickers once they come into the United States. And in combined operations, including work from the marshals and the, uh, and the U.S. attorney's offices, um, uh, investigates uh, using the latest investigative tools and prosecutes. Um, the DEA has, at the very end of the line, a public affairs campaign. We have to cut off the demand as well. And that's why we emphasize that one pill can kill. That's why I went to the DEA headquarters and met with the families, the very kind of families that you're talking about young people who have died taking a pill they had no idea was fentanyl. What percentage of your drug trafficking work, what percent is tied to illegal smuggling from Mexico? Well, I can't, get, I can't give a, a number in that regard, but it, as I said, um, the vast majority of fentanyl comes into the United States um, smuggled in trucks and uh, cars uh, coming across ports of entry. That's what the Department of Homeland Security has identified. To be even clearer, uh, would, would your counter-drug efforts be even more successful if we had complete control of our southern border? If we had the X-ray machines um, and other investigative devices necessary to detect fentanyl as it was coming across the border, Absolutely. Um, if we could cut off that flow, um, that would uh, vastly uh, decrease. Um, there will be other ways that people will try to get, get it in through the mail, through shipping, et cetera. But if we could cut off um, um, uh, fentanyl crossing the border uh, using these new technologies, that would make an enormous uh, dent uh, in, in the dangerous uh, poison that is flooding our cities. Last week, uh, we had... Uh FBI Director Ray sitting in the seat you now occupy. Um, he noted that he wished there was more cooperation from Mexico about drug trafficking. Uh, from a department-wide counter-drug perspective, what is the level of cooperation we are receiving or not from Mexico? I would echo what the director said. I wish there were more uh, cooperation. Uh, we are getting uh, cooperation. We have had extraditions. They have destroyed uh, some labs. They have reduced precursors company coming into the company, country. But we need much, much more uh, cooperation. As I understand it, the current Mexican government has severely constrained DOJ's ability to work alongside their Mexican counterparts to disrupt the cartels. What is the department and this administration doing to restore full law enforcement partnerships with Mexican partners? Yeah. So the FBI has, is, uh, I think, as the director uh, testified, um, has been successful in setting up some vetting teams. I have personally gone to Mexico to speak with the attorney general uh, to um, uh, re-up the degree of cooperation that had previously existed with the DEA. Uh, I would say I've not been completely successful in that effort yet, uh, but I am persistent and I will not give up until um, uh, the cooperation with DEA is as fulsome as possible. There are people based on uh, that uh, lack of a border control who say that the Mexican government really is complicit with the cartels. Would you say that? Well, I don't, I don't want to comment on that specifically. The, are, the cartels are enormously profitable. Um, they have more, ma more money than some nation states. Um, and there are um, uh, places in Mexico where it is difficult to, to deal with the cartels. I will say that when um, um, uh, Mexican uh, law enforcement and particularly uh, the naval forces, the Marines, uh, and the Army have gone uh, to arrest people that we've extradited. This has come at enormous loss to them as well. Um, um, I, I called um, the Secretary of the Navy there to give my condolences for the deaths of Marines in connection 
uh, with the arrest of uh, Ovidio. Uh, they have a very difficult job, uh, as we do. Mr. Garland. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Attorney General Garland, uh, it didn't escape my notice that you commented on crime statistics a little bit in your opening statement. Is that correct? Yes. And we keep track of crime statistics here in the United States, not just federal crimes, but all state and local crimes. Uh, we keep track of violent crimes. We keep track of uh, crimes against property. Uh, am I correct in that? Yes, that's what the FBI's uh, Uniform Crime Reports, now the NIBRS reports. And you said homicides dropped more last year than any other year in the last 30 years. Is that right? That's right. It's not just limited to a drop in homicide, though, uh, is it, Attorney General Garland? No, the FBI shows a decrease in violent crime across the board as well. And it's not just limited to a decrease in, in violent crime. Yesterday, a reputable analytics company came out with a report uh, that reviewed all of the national information on crime. Um, and it, it's if you separate out violent crime versus property crime, take violent crime. He noted uh, uh, violent crime is down a considerable amount. Violent crime including murder, down, manslaughter, down, rape, down, robbery, down, aggravated assault, down, all of them down a considerable amount. Uh, and then even into property crime, uh, with the exception of motor vehicle theft, uh, burgl burglary down, larceny theft down, all of these down a considerable considerable amount. Am I stating that correctly, Attorney General Garland? Uh, you are. Um, there, obviously, there's differences in different places in the country, and some have gone up and some have gone down, but those are the overall numbers. I also want to say I think I, I understated the success on homicide. It's actually the largest deduction in 50 years. It's down uh, more than any other, other year in the last 50 years. Right. I think I said 30, but 50, I think, is the correct number. Thank you for the correction, Attorney General Garland. And thank you for the, the, the good hard work of, uh, of solid police work and, and, and solid uh, uh, prosecutorial work uh, that uh, uh, done not only by the Department of Justice, by the st but by also by the state and local police and prosecutors. Um, that's who deserves the credit for this, isn't it? They are it? the ones who deserve the credit. Um, we support them. We help them. We deal with the most difficult uh, crimes. We provide them with technological support. Uh, but the people with the, who are actually face-to-face uh, -face with violent crime in their communities are the state and local uh, police and law enforcement. Well, you are here today before the appropriations panel, and we're the ones that, that fund your efforts. Uh, one of the, the most important areas that, that I look into are the, uh, the COPS hiring grants. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned in my opening statement, the, the burn justice assistance grants. Uh, I've been very proud to bring grants home in both of those areas to fund local police and also to fund efforts by our local district attorneys. Um, and uh, these are the ones that deserve the credit for that huge drop in crime over the last year, aren't they? I quite agree with that, yes. Uh, and don't let me put words in your mouth, Attorney no. General. What else do you, do you, who else deserves the credit for this, this big drop in crime that America has experienced? Uh, look, um, we know, the, and because we've had experience over decades now with the right kind of strategies for reducing violent crime, uh, these involve these strategies from the federal point of view uh, require the kind of cooperation, the non-siloing that uh, the chairman was speaking among all of our agencies. Um, are then creating joint task forces with state and local law enforcement, uh, who are enormous um, uh, force multipliers for the department. Um, our U.S. attorneys' offices who reach out to communities. Our grant programs uh, to support community violence interrupters uh, who, who, are, who go out into communities and um, prevent uh, the crime from happening in the first place, who are willing to uh, meet with uh, potentially violent people and talk them down. So um, uh, uh, the importance of our grants to local communities to enhance good relationships between the police and the communities 
uh, because we don't get good policing and, and, and effective policing unless the community trusts the police. So it's a combination across the board of federal law enforcement, state and local law enforcement, community engagement. Well, that's well said. I, I, I want to focus on hiring of attorneys to go into prosecution work. Uh, Attorney General, what is the Department of Justice doing right now to prioritize creating efficiencies in its hiring and reducing the time to hire so that we have enough attorneys working for the Department of Justice and in prosecution generally? Well, with respect to um, law enforcement uh, reduction in time to hire, um, this is a significant issue with respect to um, uh, retention, promotion, recruitment in law enforcement. Sometimes um, both federal law enforcement and state and local law enforcement take so long to hire the person to go through the whole background and vetting process that the person already accepts another job um, before we can finish that process and before state and locals can. So our COPS office has created a, a playbook for state and local law enforcement uh, to uh, increase and streamline uh, that process. And of course, we are looking internally uh, to do the same thing. Well, uh, my time has expired, Attorney General, and uh, I'll yield back, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Garcia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, thank you, Attorney uh, General uh, Garland, for being here today. Uh, I view these annual appropriations uh, hearings as uh, similar to in investor uh, briefs, annual investor briefs, right? We get to talk to you about what's, what's going on in your organization, the money you're asking for, the past performance, the vision, uh, the path forward. I don't think most Americans know what uh, the Department of Justice does. Uh, I don't think most Americans know what the Attorney General does. So I went on your website uh, and just uh, printed out the mission statement. Uh, the mission statement of the Department of Justice is to uphold the rule of law, to keep our country safe, and to protect civil rights. Pretty straightforward, pretty simple. You've been in office uh, since 2021. Uh, you report directly to the President, um, and you know your mission. Um, for your investors, the American taxpayers, how would you grade your performance over the last three years relative to that mission? Well, I would grade the work of our. Career. And I'm talking about I'm talking about you, uh, Attorney General. Yeah. With all due respect to, to to you and your and your and your team, uh, I have all the respect in the world for the agents in the field. They are doing God's work on a daily basis. So this line of questioning is is specifically about you, as someone who is on the cabinet, reports directly to the president uh, during a period of record high crime rates. Uh, uh, before my colleagues across the aisle get, get offended. Uh, I am not talking about the agents in the field here. I think they're doing God's work. They're doing A-plus with the resources uh, that they're given and the policies that they're working under. I'm asking you, how would you grade yourself as the Attorney General of the United States? Well, you ask about violent crime. I think what the Attorney General does with respect to violent crime is set forth a strategy for fighting violent crime and ensures that it's carried out throughout the department, throughout the country. So what I did almost immediately after I came into office. Just, I don't mean to cut you off, but we're short on time. I'm just asking for a grade, A through F. How are you doing? I'm going to give myself an A, um, but uh, okay. um, with room for improvement. Okay. Let me explain to you why I would give you an F. Um, and we just heard why Mr. Cartwright from Pennsylvania was citing the, the decline in crime nationwide. Your mission is to uphold the rule of law, and, and crossing the border is a crime. It is illegal per Penal Code uh, 8 U.S.C. 1325. Crossing international border is a crime. We have 7.5 million people under your tenure who have come across our border. Uh, when you say there's a decline in homicides by about 20%, historic high in, dec in decline in homicides in 30 years or 50 years, whatever the number is, does that include the 75,000 people who were killed by fentanyl or poisoned by fentanyl by, in many cases, dealers who knew they actually were selling uh, fentanyl, and the victims did not. Uh, does that does that decline in homicides in, of 20% include the 75,000 fentanyl poisonings? I'm sure that it does not include the fentanyl poisoning. It Those does. were American lives lost, though, right? Who were who were killed by illicit drug dealers for the most That's part. Right. So why is that not That's considered right. a homicide? That's right. Our U.S. Attorney's offices do per, um, pursue fentanyl um, traffickers, um, and including even the sale of uh, small amounts where we can establish that the trafficker is the one who uh, caused the death. Do you have a? Do you charge him with homicide when that's the case? We have a. There's a, 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 a narcotics statute 
um, that includes um, a sentencing enhancement for death. We don't we don't prosecute homicides. Those are state okay, laws. Okay, so I just want to be clear. When we're putting the cape on and saying there's a 20 percent reduction in homicides, we are not counting the 75,000 Americans that, that have been killed by this drug over the each year. I don't believe the second is. metric of keeping our country safe. Uh, we talk about uh, uh, the, the death to America chance in, in some of our cities. We heard uh, Ray's testimony last year that we're in one of the most precarious positions our nation has been in, in, in our nation's history in the last several decades. We have 10,000 people entering our border a day illegally. 7,000% increase in Chinese immigrants coming across our border illegally, 10,000 people a day uh, coming across the borders, and that's about a 40% increase since your watch began in FY21. 350 people on the known terror watch list. Eight in 10 Americans feel less secure uh, than they did just three or four years ago per the, per the uh, Pew Research Center. Uh, so your assessment of yourself, I think, I think an admir someone who is in your position, literally reports directly to the president. It's an attribute of a leader in that position has to be self-aware. They have to have the courage to tell the boss that the boss is screwing up, especially when it's leading to the loss of lives at a level that, that is unprecedented. And, and I think you're, you're giving yourself a, an A and under these circumstances demonstrates a lack of self-awareness, frankly. Uh, I think you've earned an F. Uh, I think you're, you need to talk to your boss and tell them that the policies are killing us. It's not the lack of money. Uh, I respect the $37 billion uh, in, in investment request here. If I was in charge, I'd give you more. Um, but it's the policies that are broken. Um, and so with that, I'm out of time. Uh, I'm happy to discuss more things. Uh, but, I, but I will wait for the second round to talk about uh, the, the treatment of law and the application of law to certain demographics. Uh, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Morelli. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to yield uh, some time to my colleague. Yeah, and I'd like to uh, give the Attorney General a chance to respond to what he just heard. Yeah. So I didn't hear a question in that at all, and I disagree with almost everything that you've said, but I want to be clear that the border responsibility, you're talking to the wrong department here. The Department of Homeland Security is the department responsible preventing things from coming across the border. The President and the Secretary of Homeland Security have proposed a bipartisan bill to protect the border, to reduce the number of people who come across, and to increase the um, money spent to prevent fentanyl from coming across the border. So that would be my recommendation in that respect. And I'll yield back to Mr. Morelli. Thank you, uh, Mr. Carwright. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and and I'll, I'll just... Uh, uh, editorialize. This is the second hearing I've been at, both with the director of the FBI and the Attorney General. They've been personally attacked, and I want to underscore, there was a bipartisan deal on the table, and as I understand it, the former president persuaded people not to participate in that because he didn't want a political win and cared about the politics over the safety of the United States people and the American people. So I'm getting tired at these hearings of listening uh, to these attacks when they can be addressed. Um, Having said that, Mr. Attorney General, thank you for taking the time to be with us today, and certainly thank you for your long service to the country. I want to begin uh, by thanking your staff and you for having provided detailed feedback on a bill uh, which I have reintroduced, the Preventing Deepfakes of Intimate Images Act. Um, this is to prohibit the disclosure of non-consensual uh, deepfake pornography, obviously a growing and alarming problem in the United States. 96% uh, of all deepfakes involve uh, pornography on the internet, uh, and as I work to pass this legislation into law, which I hope I want to uh, hope that I can continue to have lines of communication open uh, to you and to the department, and I wanted to thank you for that. Um, if I can, uh, sir, there's obviously been a lot of public reporting on the release of the special counsel Robert Hur's report back in February this year. Uh, I'm certainly not asking you to comment on the substance of the report, which has been talked about publicly, but as a member of the president's cabinet, someone who has regular contact with the president, would you like to comment on President uh, Biden's uh, fitness uh, generally? Well, look, I'm, I'm uh, start by thanking you for recognizing that I can't comment and won't comment about uh, a special counsel's report at all. But if you're asking me about my own observations as a member of the National Security Council and a member of the president's cabinet, I have complete confidence in the president. I have watched him expertly guide uh, meetings of staff and uh, cabinet members on issues of foreign affairs and um, military strategy and policy 
in the, in the incredibly complex world uh, in which we uh, uh, now face um, and in which he has been decif decisive uh, in instructions uh, to the staff and decisive in making the decisions necessary to protect the country. Likewise, with respect to domestic policy discussions, these are intricate, complicated questions that he has guided all of us through in order to reach results that are helpful and important and beneficial to the American people. I could not have more confidence in the president. Good. Thank you, sir. Um, I have a number of questions which I may submit uh, in writing, but uh, one thing I did uh, want to uh, get some additional comment you mentioned in your, in your testimony. In addition to my role as an appropriator, I'm uh, proud to serve as the ranking uh, Democrat on the uh, Committee on House Administration, which has jurisdiction over federal election reforms. In July of 21, the Department of Justice launched a task force to address the rise in threats against election workers uh, and election officials. In addition to threats of violence and intimidation, our country's election workers face new and unique pressures driven by the rapid spread of misinformation by extremists. Um, with less than eight months before the, um, the general election, can you provide an update on the activities of the task force and the department's plans to ensure the election workers are protected from threats? Yes, thank you. I, as I said um, in my opening remarks, I think the threats to election workers, uh, particularly the volunteer election workers, um, but obviously also the secretaries of state and the appointed administrators, um, and this is a, a real threat to our democracy to have the people who are running our elections afraid to continue uh, their work. Um, and so we have, um, I have uh, personally spoken to all of our United States attorneys by video and in, in addition in person during our conferences. Um, the FBI um, has um, um, uh, agents uh, devoted to this uh, issue um, and um, we have this task force that you're talking about. Uh, we have prosecuted more than uh, about around 20 uh, cases now, um, uh, many of which have um, yielded uh, significant sentences, um, and we have investigated many, many more and disrupted other kinds of threats. Um, so we are, we are completely seized uh, with the importance of um, uh, preventing, deterring, disrupting uh, threats against our election workers. Very good. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chair, I uh, yield back. Mr. Clyde. Thank you, uh, Chairman Rogers. Attorney General Garland, as I understand it, the Hatch Act generally prohibits federal employees from lobbying Congress on legislation while on the job. Last week, when the House was considering legislation to reform and reauthorize the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, did you or anyone in your office make phone calls to members of Congress urging them to oppose the Biggs Amendment to require the government to obtain a warrant prior to spying on American citizens through FISA Section, 02, Section 702. A yes or no will suffice. The Hatch Act and the Constitution permit the members of the President's administration to speak with members who are interested in questions about the effect of legislation, just like you are asking me today about effects. If we ask, that's one thing, but if we don't ask and you actually reach out, that's a different that thing. That does not violate any law of any kind. O okay, so so you, will you answer my question? Yes, I discussed um, the um, vital um, United States interest in extending uh, 702 with members. How many members did you call? I'm not going to get into my conversations with members. I'm, I'm not asking about the conversations. I'm, I'm asking about how get, many members I'm did you call. I'm not going to get into that question, but I'm telling you okay. there is nothing right. unlawful. This is the basic. On March 3rd, 2024, at the Tabernacle Baptist Church in Selma, Alabama, you made comments regarding our country's elections and election security laws passed by various states. Specifically, you claimed that democracy was under attack by, and I quote, discriminatory, burdensome, and unnecessary restrictions on access to the ballot. Attorney General, do you believe requiring an ID to vote in a federal election is discriminatory? Yes or no? I spoke at the um, uh, just iconic yes or no. church from which the March for Voting uh, Rights began. Um, the Supreme, just a yes or no will be fine. The answer is the Supreme Court's decision says that undue burdens on voting rights caused by um, um, voter IDs can be unconstitutional, but that what? the burdens... That's right. That's what the Supreme Voter ID can be unconstitutional. It can be, depending on the burdens and the discriminatory way in which they are taken. This is... Uh, uh, okay. So do you think it's important to positively identify every voter to ensure that they are a legal voter? I think, as you called it, a legitimate voter. No. 
uh, you have to be a United States citizen. You have to meet the qualifications for it to be a voter. It's important that only those people vote. Um, so how do you prove that? I mean, how do you prove what a person is if you don't require ID? I mean, you require ID to get on an airplane. They're not going to let you on an airplane. I well, don't know what your illegal, experience I guess. has been, uh, but I have voted every year of my entire life, and I've never been asked to show an identification. I have always been asked to show identification. Well, then we have, but I, I, wow. Somehow the democracy so, has gone on without Attorney that. General Garland, do you believe that illegal aliens residing in the United States should be allowed to vote in federal elections, yes or no? No. All right, great. We agree on something. Other than U.S. citizens, are there any other legitimate voters? You have to be a U.S. citizen to vote you, in the federal You must election. be a U.S. citizen. Okay, great. All right. Um, I ask unanimous consent to uh, add this to the record, Mr. Chairman. Th Thank you, sir. Uh, this is a poster found um, in the city, outside the city of Matamoros. It um, was posted around the migrant camps, and uh, it is a poster from... Uh, H-I-A-S, the Immigrant Aid Society. And this particular poster says, the resource center is a six-unit complex that is home of H-I-A-S. And at the very bottom, it says, reminder to vote for President Biden when you are in the United States. We need another year of your mandate to stay open. That's what this, that's what this poster says. Reminds illegal immigrants to vote for President Biden. So is the Department of Justice concerned about illegal aliens voting in federal elections? The Department of Justice is uh, concerned about any um, illegalities with respect to voting. I've never seen that poster. I've never heard of that poster. That's the first time I've ever ha heard anybody even mention that poster. Well, now you have. So if any non-citizens vote in federal elections, are you going to prosecute them at the federal level? If anybody violates the voting laws, and if they are federal voting laws, then and we will investigate and prosecute as appropriate. All right. That's good to hear. I appreciate that. With the additional money you asked for the Civil Rights Division, I hope that you prosecute illegal voting. Now, last year you promised to provide the prosecution of crime statistics for the city of Washington, D.C. for the last five years. It was a question that I asked you. Um, I have not yet received them. So I'm okay. asking you again today, do you commit to provide these, these statistics, the prosecution of crime statistics for the city of Washington, D.C.? Um, will you provide these in the next 30 days? I'll ask my staff to get in touch with yours. I don't know what the problem is with respect to providing those. It doesn't seem like there should be a problem. Okay, great. Thank you. I appreciate your commitment to provide them, Attorney General. And uh, my time's expired, and I yield back. Attorney General, you have the power to three yeah. Committee will be in order. The chair reminds our guests that disruptive demonstrations from the audience are a violation of House rules. Any additional disruptions will require law enforcement to remove protesters from the room and restore order. Mr. Tron. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and Ranking Member Cartwright, and uh, thank you, Attorney General Garland, for appearing here today, and thank you for your patience as you deal with this uh, committee. Um, I'm a co-chair of the Bipartisan Second, Cha task for, uh, Second Chance Task Force, and we're concerned about staffing shortages at the BOP. The BOP is funded at 93%, but we're only staffed at 86%. What's happening is education a wraparound services for mental health, et cetera, which can improve our outcomes, job training, get left behind. Uh, so we're all in agreement on that. We'd like to figure out how to implement the Bipartisan uh, First Step Act successfully. And to do that, we've got to have the staffing. Uh, could you talk a minute about what this does to lead allow, to lousy outcomes uh, where we can't cut our prison budget because we don't give folks a second chance to win and succeed. I think the, thanks for the question. I think the First Step Act was extremely uh, important. Um, 
by focusing on education of inmates. It helps reduce recidivism after people leave. And of course, if we can uh, reduce recidiv recidivism after reentry, we can drive down the violent crime rate and prevent it from going up. Um, the, the Bureau of Prisons makes every effort um, to um, ensure that the staffing shortages that you're referring to don't impact the First Step Act programming as well as the medication-assisted treatment programming. But um, uh, to be frank, um, if you're asking me what we need most in order uh, to protect um, the ability uh, to have full staffing at the Bureau of Prisons, we need uh, the money um, for uh, hiring and retention incentives. Being a uh, correctional officer and be, or being a first step administrator, these are dangerous jobs um, uh, in facilities um, um, that are not um, that have not been kept up over decades, and where there um, are adjoining facilities, sometimes state and local facilities, that pay more money. So I'd say, if you're asking me for the one thing that I that will give us uh, a better chance here for the First Step Act and for the Second Chance Act. Uh, it would be to give us uh, the money that we're requesting, which is uh, $205.4 million for hiring and retention. Incentive. So quite simply, the dollars that you give you, the proper amount of money, will result in saving millions, tens of millions more down the line by cutting recidivism. I do think that the money we have um, to provide more um, um, incentives for people to stay on the job in the Bureau of Prisons means that the chances of reducing recidivism will increase. That sounds like a smart investment to me. Second quick question. 75% of BOP inmates uh, do not have a photo ID when they leave prison. They can't secure housing, apply for jobs, open a bank account, federal benefit programs, etc. The Bureau is addressing this by providing some IDs to U.S. citizens now. Uh, we have a bipartisan bill, uh, the BOP Release Card Act, that supports this effort at the BOP by ensuring new IDs fulfill all the requirements and directs BOP to work with the states to have a one-on-one -on -one exchange so we can work right with the states to move these folks into getting their new ID card and then successfully be able to exchange that for state ID cards. Uh, so we would appreciate uh, your, success, your help in moving this bill forward. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, we would be happy to give technical assistance, um, and I, I think we may, my, our staff may have already, our staffs may have already get consulted on this. But of course, we'd be happy to give technical assistance. The BOP has implemented its own release ID program in October of 2023, and they're on track for full implementation uh, by the spring. Excellent, thank you. The DEA has extended current telemedicine flexibilities for prescribing controlled medications through December 31, 24. But there's not a revised proposed rule, and many patients are at risk of losing access to prescriptions needed for mental health and substance use disorder. Uh, last year, my colleagues and I expressed concerns about the proposed DEA rule that would have limited patient access to buprenorphine and encouraged, evidence, and encouraged an evidence-based approach to make permanent the use of audio-only or audio-visual telehealth technology for a buprenorphine prescribing. Uh, this is crucial to reach these patient populations, including unhoused, rural, tribal. So as a follow-up to that letter, we introduced the TREATS Act, which allows medication for opioid use disorder to be prescribed via telemedicine. What's DOJ's position on the continued use of telehealth flexibilities to ensure access to these medic medically necessary substance use disorder treatment, and how is this supported in your budget request? So uh, as you uh, noted, the uh, DEA and HHS have extended uh, the current telemedicine flexibilities until December 31st of this year. Uh, DEA has uh, issued a proposed rule um, which would allow authorized providers to prescribe uh, medicines for opioid use disorder via telemedicine. Uh, they are working to promulgate a final year uh, by the, uh, I'm sorry, a final rule uh, by the fall of this year. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. Just quickly, restrictive housing, otherwise known as solitary confinement, outdated, inhumane practice, often used way too far too often. Uh, we believe the BOP has been dragging its feet to reform this area of restrictive housing. In the past 10 years, DOG has conducted studies 
and task force to improve restrictive housing, yet we fail to make any progress. Uh, what steps can DOJ and BOP take together so we can make this more effective uh, and improve restrictive housing policies? Well, the, the new BOP director is very much uh, committed um, to what you're talking about. Uh, BOP recently uh, published a proposed rule on discipline designed to reduce the use of restrictive housing uh, for disciplinary segregation. Um, BOP is trying to hire more psychologists and provide de-escalation training, which would help uh, reduce the need uh, for restrictive housing. Excellent. Thank you very much. I yield back. John Garland, if you would please uh, move the microphone closer to Oh, I'm sorry. To you. We're having a little trouble I don't trouble know if I, can move the, I can't move the microphone. Uh, Mr. Klein. Thank you, Mr. Attorney General, for being here. Um, I listened with interest to your opening statement, and I have to say I'm uh, concerned that your uh, actions are speaking louder than your words, especially when you say uh, there's, one set of, there's not one set of laws for uh, Democrats and another for Republicans. Uh, my constituents and all, many Americans uh, are watching your actions, which are speaking louder than your words, when it comes to there really is a crisis of confidence in this country in your department uh, being created by uh, the dual treatment of American citizens depending on their viewpoints or uh, their political positions or their political offices, uh, whether, you know, as your department is, is currently prosecuting a former president for handling, handling classified documents, uh, you, your office, and I'm assuming you personally, declined to take action against President Biden for his willful mishandling of classified documents. I, I'm, I appreciate you making the report of Special Counsel Robert Hur public, as was done historically with every other uh, special counsel. Uh, did you review the report prior to its release? Before I released it, yes. I read it before okay. I released it, yes. Uh, did you approve of the recommendation? Obviously, you approved of the recommendations because you have it within your power to okay. prosecute, correct? I'm not going to comment or edit editorialize on the special counsel's report. I promised I would release it. I did release it. Uh, the report speaks for itself. The special counsel sat for something like five hours worth of testimony on the subject and any question uh, about uh, results he reached could have been asked. And so you won't say whether you concur with the conclusions? I will say, as I said at the time it was released, that I was not going to editorialize or comment on the report. I think that's inappropriate for an attorney general. So you won't agree that Biden would have come across to a jury as a sympathetic, well-meaning elderly man with a poor memory? I've said before, and I'll say again with respect to the report, that um, um, it's improper for the attorney general to editorialize. You've uh, talked about. I take that separately from the question you're asking, and ask if you're asking me about my own observations about the president. No, you testified to that fact, and I yes, heard you I have the first time. Confidence in the president. Have you ever seen evidence of impairment in your meetings with the president? I'm sorry. Um, I, I, I testified, and I'll repeat again what I just said. Well, that's I've different seen, than my question. Well, I have seen the president effectively guide the uh, members of the department, of, of his cabinet, uh, uh, and his military. Through but you won't say you've ever seen uh, any impairment on his part? Uh, the, the, the president yeah. has no impairment. The president... You've is, never seen any? I don't know how many ways I can say this. Okay. I have complete confidence in the president, and I reject your characterization. Okay. Uh, let's talk about the audio recordings of Special Counsel Hur's interviews with President Biden's ghostwriter, Mark Zwanaker. Uh, you're in possession of those, correct? Justice Department is possession of them. Has the White House been permitted access to those recordings? Uh, I, I don't know what uh, Mr. Herr uh, provided, but I expect that the answer is yes. So they have access. Let me let you know. Well, maybe you're aware. How many times the Judiciary Committee has asked for those documents, for asked for those recordings? I know that the Judiciary Committee has asked. We have sent a letter explaining our position with respect to the recordings. Three we times. Have, we have provided transcripts of the recordings. Or recordings. Mr. Harris testified about um, um, his observations during his interviews. These are interviews of a witness. It is um, a longstanding practice of the Justice Department to keep these kinds of documents 
uh, confidential in order to not chill future investigations. Confidential, but you provided copies to the White House. They're the wit. He, this is the witness. Uh, his, the witnesses own. Do you normally provide interviews. witnesses in investigations access to their recordings of their interviews. I don't, I, sometimes we do, and sometimes we don't. But here, there are, uh, as you well know. There are um, um, uh, privileges to be uh, uh, with respect to national security and other information that were addressed in those um, um, recordings and in the interviews. Um, and um, um, the, the transcripts themselves had to be uh, cleared through an interagency process. Uh, you know that because we said that in the letter uh, to the committee. Okay, so in my 20 seconds, I want to ask uh, about something you answered to Congressman Clyde. You said following the court's rulings that IDs to vote can be an undue burden. Uh, do you know of a, a, an example, or is there uh, any case in which you would consider a photo ID to not be an undue burden? Say, if it's a free uh, ID, uh, IDs to everybody. You have a good, very good example. There, there was the case in which the Supreme Court noted that there was free IDs completely available to everyone um, without discrimination in those circumstances. The court upheld the law. Yes, and you and you. Well, I follow the law and agree the with that court, uh, decision. And whether I agree or not, it's the law, and the rule of law requires us to follow it. And that's not what I'm talking about here. All right. Thank you. I yield back. The subcommittee will stand in recess, subject to the call of the chair. And the chair recognizes the ranking member of the full committee, Ms. DeLauro. Thank you very much. A lot of hearings happening at the same time, but uh, delighted that you're here this morning. And um, uh, what I wanted to uh, look at is the issue of um, uh, uh, crime, if you will, and trade. Uh, DOJ plays a critical role in deterring crime uh, through uh, robust investigations, prosecutions, incarcerations, and the application of penalties. My concern about DOJ that there may be some serious blind spots and lack of resources in critical areas, in particular the U.S. international trade enforcement. Example, 2022 U.S. imports were $3.27 trillion. Conservative estimates based on available data from Economic Policy Institute projected 5 to 10 percent of those imports were fraudulent. This means that there's annually 163 to 327 billion dollars in illegal trade which impacts U.S. workers, manufacturers, consumers, and our free trade partners. I understand DOJ's infrastructure to combat trade crimes is lightly resourced. Um, 2022, U.S. Customs and Border Protection collected 19.4 million in penalties on $3.27 trillion of trade. That seems to me to be a drop in the bucket. Uh, I understand that international trade prosecutions are also low to non-existent. A couple of questions. Can you give us a sense of DOG resources you are using to prosecute these bad actors associated with crimes that violate trade laws? How do you work with CBP and HSI? Um, uh, on, uh, uh, to increase the number of prosecutions. Um, would you say, based on DHS enforcement data, that combating international trade crime is a priority within DOJ? Why or why not? Um, and how familiar are you with DOJ's efforts and resources dedicated to investigating and prosecuting international trade crimes? What's your assessment of the department's actions, including the number of prosecutions and penalties? Thank you. Uh, you uh, put your finger on an important uh, risk uh, to our economy, which is uh, fraudulent trade goods. Um, that's why we ha have a trade fraud task force, which um, enhances collaboration between the Justice Department and the other agencies that you were uh, discussing to investigate trade fraud. Uh, it helped initiate more than 70 investigations involving hundreds of millions of dollars of fraudulently imported goods. Uh, one good example is just last month, the Ford Motor Company agreed to pay $365 million to settle custom civil penalty claims related to misclassified and undervalued items. So um, I recognize the significance of uh, this for our economy, and um, I believe our Justice Department task force is 
working well uh, with other departments on this matter, including the Department of Homeland Security. Do you, do you have enough uh, personnel to, to take on this issue and in, in, uh, in, in resources in a more robust way? As I said, $3.27 trillion, we collect $19.4 million. That seems to be some great disparity. And I, I'm just asking, no, no. what do you need yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, from us to be able to deal with this area on, on international trade where we're getting killed? Yeah. You, you know? um, but the Justice Department would always like more money. I understand that, but, <laughs> but we the, need an assessment. Yeah. Of, I, I think that the money that we're requesting for our civil divisions, uh, Consumer Protection Branch, which deals with civil uh, this kind of fraud, and our criminal divisions uh, 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 fraud section, which deals with this on the criminal side, and the U.S. Attorney's offices um, that uh, deal with this in each of the um, di uh, 94 districts, um, and the FBI's uh, corporate crime and fraud sections. Um, given the budget priorities, I think we're asking for the appropriate amount. There's obviously always trade-offs, um, but uh, we are, we are uh, I think, able to fund a, a robust, robust program. Uh, the most difficult uh, aspect of this, of course, is identifying the fraudulent goods as they come in. And that really is a customs uh, um, and therefore a homeland security uh, issue. And they, I'm sure, uh, would say the same uh, to you, that they need more money for this purpose. Uh, I'm going to like to pursue that. I'm just going to say something very quickly. I'm running out of time. Uh, the, uh, uh, as you know, antitrust received, this is antitrust division, uh, roughly a 4% increase in 2024 over the prior year. I want to ensure that we can continue to justify these critical investments, protect consumers from unfair and anti-competitive business practices. Uh, do I have your commitment that we can work together? I would like to work with you and with my staff on answering questions that we have on what resources the antitrust division, and frankly, this could apply to all of DJG, DOJ, that you will need for 2025. Yes, of course, we'd be very eager um, to speak with you about that. Our, our, the total we've requested is, is uh, $288 million, which is an increase of um, $55 million over uh, the enacted <laughs> FY24. I will say I've always been concerned about this. I entered the Justice Department in 1979, and we barely have uh, more uh, attorneys in the antitrust division now than we had in 1979. I think this is the first year we've been able to bring the number up to the number of attorneys we had when I first entered the mm -hmm. department. Mm -hmm. But we'd like to work with you on how well we can track the resources that are necessary for you to be able uh, to do your job. And as a final comment, I'm very, very interested. Last night, listen to the uh, 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 FTC a commissioner, and about the working together with <coughs> DOJ, because we have serious issues which affect consolidation, which raises prices in this nation, makes anti-competitiveness uh, a reality, and how between DOJ and the FTC uh, we can address these issues in a very, very robust, strong way to get at ending uh, these uh, uh, monopolies, if you will, that only increase prices uh, for the American people. Thank you very much. You. I yield back. Chairman Otterhold. Thank you. Um, uh, General Garland, good to have you here. Uh, thanks for uh, your time. Uh, I, I want to focus on a question, something I don't think we've, uh, any questions have been so far, and that's on the Bureau of Prisons. And um, I understand, according to the um, the Bureau of Prison website, there are less than 350, I'm sorry, 35,000 employees to ensure the security of all the federal uh, prisons and services that include 156,000 federal inmates. Uh, what steps is the Bureau of Prison taking to address gaps in correctional, correctional officer and training and leader training? And um, Oh, is there a reason that the Bureau of Prisons uh, correctional leaders have not participated in the Prison Fellowship Warden Exchange, which is offered without cost to the federal government? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know about the latter um, question that you asked, but I'd be happy to uh, have our staff look into it um, on the warden training and get uh, in touch with you. Um, we have a um, the pandemic um, 
delayed the Bureau of Prisons' ability to provide in-person uh, training, but uh, BOP has since um, resumed many in-person trainings and is trying to clear the backlog in, in that respect. Um, you are right um, with respect uh, to the number of, um, of employees we have in the Bureau of Prisons. It's really not sufficient. It's not sufficient either for um, uh, the necessary protection the necess uh, or for the educational uh, programs that we have. And as I discussed uh, earlier with another member of the panel, the problem here is uh, um, recruitment, retention, and promotion. Um, and the best, I think that the, the most important thing that the committee can do is to give us the money that we're asking for, for hiring uh, and retention incentives. Do you know of any law or regulation that prevents or limits the Bureau of Prisons from accepting donations or services or programs from a nonprofit as long as they don't accept federal funds? I'm afraid I don't know about that, but I'd be happy to have our staff look into that and get back to your staff. Okay, if you could look at it and see if there is examples where their community or faith-based programs could be helpful. My understanding is that as long as they don't receive federal funds, then uh, then uh, there are programs out there to be of assistance, and uh, I would appreciate you looking into that and let me know if uh, that was something that uh, might be possible because I think it is a real could be real helpful. Uh, of course, back on October the 7th of last year, we all know what happened, and uh, along with the uh, attack on Israel, there were uh, 30 Americans that were killed by Hamas terrorists in Israel as part of a lo larger coordinated attack uh, that left uh, 1,200 Israelis dead and over 200 abducted. And uh, it is my understanding that uh, eight Americans remain hostage in Gaza. Uh, I understand three of whom are no longer alive. But um, you announced that the Justice Department was investigating at the death and the kidnappings of the Americans during the attack. Uh, can you give us uh, here on the uh, subcommittee an update on the investigation into the death and kidnapping of those Americans? And is the Justice Department looking to pursue criminal charges against individuals responsible for, the, for those attacks? So the uh, killing uh, or kidnapping of Americans abroad is a federal crime. Uh, so, of course, that is what we're investigating, as I said, um, for uh, potential criminal prosecution. Uh, we have been um, uh, involved in uh, discussions uh, with Israeli law enforcement and intelligence services to help us uh, get uh, evidence and information in this regard. Um, I really can't say anything more about the progress of in the investigation, but this is a uh, a matter of uh, a, uh, extreme concern for us. This was the, uh, in addition, of course, to the killing of the Americans, this was the largest mass killing of Jews um, since the Holocaust. Can you can you say that uh, 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 that y'all that the department is pursuing criminal charges against these individuals? We're investigating that. We're investigating. Uh, we have a criminal investigation. Uh, in connection with the deaths and kidnapping of Americans um, in Israel on October 7th. Can you yes. speak more broadly to the department's work in investigating Hamas threats to, U to the U.S., including efforts by Hamas to raise money in the U.S.? Yes. Um, so um, um, uh, uh, just at a high level of generality, because I don't want to talk about matters that I, I can't talk about in an open session, but we do have investigations, financial investigations with respect to Hamas, uh, which we've had uh, for a number of years. Uh, October 7th, as the um, um, uh, FBI director um, uh, noted in his testimony, uh, has raised our threat level uh, considerably with respect to concerns uh, of foreign terrorist organizations uh, like Hamas um, uh, that might foment problems in the United States. That includes not only Hamas, but Hezbollah, um, the Iranian Quds Force, um, um, ISIS, ISIS-K, uh, uh, um, various sects of uh, uh, branches of Al-Qaeda. Um, uh, we are concerned and, um, um, and are um, um, making sure that all of our joint terrorism task forces are on the lookout for um, these matters since October 7th. Uh, there was a heightened concern before October 7th, but obviously October 7th has only uh, redoubled our concern here. Thank you. I yield back. Mr. Ruppersberger. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member. Uh, Attorney General Garland, first thing I do want to say, I think that you're doing a good job. 
I wouldn't say it's always an A, as you said, because we have to watch giving ourselves an A, but it, you're close. And I, I like your experience in the justice as a, as a jurist, and then you excelled there, and now as running the FBI. So I feel secure at this point that you're the best person for that job. With that, I'm going to get into uh, China and cybersecurity. Um, the Chinese Communist Party has an army of hackers that persistently attack the United States. They, <clears throat> they stay um, dormant and keep access, access to our networks and critical infrastructure. The Chinese Communist Party uses these hackers to steal economic information and intellectual property. We also know that the Chinese Party has been working to steal and smuggle uh, ban U.S. tech uh, from our shores into mainland China. They are our biggest threat and adversary. The past March, this past March, the unsealed indictment of the APT31 group, uh, which you're familiar with, revealed a 14-year cyber campaign for intimate dissenters uh, steal U.S. trade and intellectual property to damage critical networks and spy on U.S. politicians. That's 14 years. Now, a recent intelligence advisory stated that these hackers known as Volt Typhoon have been dormant for five years, waiting just in case we are in a larger conflict with China. China is a real threat. Can you enlighten us as to the best tools we have to fight Chinese hackers? What other resources do you need? Uh, and did our FY24 budget put the department in too deep of a security hole? Uh, well, first of all, I completely agree with your characterization of the Chinese threat. They, uh, the the um, uh, People's Republic of China, the Communist Party, uh, the government of China um, uh, represents a uh, long-term, uh, persistent, uh, across-the-board threat to uh, America. Uh, in particular in the area of cybersecurity that you're talking about. The, um, 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 we, uh, the, the two major actions you're talking about uh, just from this year, the January of old typhoon uh, disruption, this was a botnet uh, that was um, implanting um, malware into our infrastructure uh, in uh, various significant parts of, of our uh, delivery of public services. Um, uh, which could, if, if activated, uh, could have been uh, um, very dangerous for us. Uh, the March uh, APT uh, indictments uh, involved the hacking of computers and uh, emails. Uh, and those are just two examples of a considerable amount of, uh, of um, um, uh, cyber hacking. So um, we have asked for more than $1.3 billion to combat cyber crime and for cybersecurity. Uh, the FBI, the National Security Division, um, have uh, asked um, for um, uh, 894 point six million dollars, uh, which is an increase in 11.9 percent over uh, FY 24. Um, as you know, FY 24 has required the FY 24 budget has required us uh, um, uh, to reduce uh, positions uh, substantially, and we are uh, in a position of uh, trying to get us back. Uh, to where uh, we were before that, but um, these, this is an area where we are uh, doubling down and are uh, very much concerned. Okay, thank you. Now, I want to get to the key bridge. Just a quick question. I know their FBI has been on site at the, uh, at the bridge, and uh, there are a lot of questions that need to be answered about what happened, like did the captain and crew were, uh, the, of the Diala know that there were power issues before the ship ever left? Uh, a criminal investigation is usually open uh, when authorities have reason to believe negligence may have caused an accident to the rise to the level of criminality. Uh, we need to make sure uh, we hold people accountable. Attorney General, is there anything you could share about the investigation? So, uh, um, as you know, uh, Congressman, the Justice Department doesn't normally comment um, on whether ex investigations exist or not, but uh, plenty of people saw uh, FBI agents on board the ship, um, so the FBI has confirmed uh, that its agents were on the ship. Um, I can't really say anything more. Thank you, and I yield back. Mr. Elsey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General Garland, welcome back. Thank you. Um, I appreciate the work the DOJ does going after legitimate criminals and protecting American citizens from foreign adversaries and especially the COPS program, which is very important 
in my rural district, as we discussed a year ago. But today I'd like to talk about the Foreign Agents Registration Act, or FARA. I bring up FARA in context of shenanigans, that's a clinical term, uh, going on in Texas. That is a proposed high-speed rail project connecting Dallas to Houston. About a decade ago, a private company called Texas Central started pushing a proposed high-speed rail project between Houston and Dallas, and they've been engaged at the federal, state, and local level in lobbying in that effort. I am vehemently opposed to this proposed project that would cut up uh, highly arable land in my district and, and rid people of their, their well-earned land and their private property. So there's a long list of controversies surrounding Texas Central, from funding and financing, eminent domain, lack of transparency, dismissing every officer and board member, and now they appear to be merely a company on paper with no board of directors. And as an aside, Texas Central has zero experience operating or building any type of transportation company. There are a few entities connected to or under Texas Central, and there's a consulting company called New Magellan Ventures that's pushing the project. Since the beginning of the project, uh, sovereign wealth funds of the Japanese government are finance, financially backing that high-speed rail proposal. A very concerning recent action was Amtrak's partnering with Texas Central in applying for an FY22 corridor identification development grant, and a $500,000 grant was approved. On April 9th, there was a news article published about Texas Central in a letter dated April 5th, addressed to you, signed by Steve Robert, Roberts from Holtman Vogel Law Firm. It say, states that Mr. Roberts was hired by Texans Against High Speed Rail and wrote it on behalf of Texans Against High Speed Rail. And Mr. Chairman, I have that letter and I ask for unanimous consent that this article and letter be introduced into the record. I'll read part of the letter to you that I think captures the concerns that I have. <clears throat> Texas Central appears to have acted and may still act as an agent of the Japanese government with regard to numerous political activities intended to influence both lawmakers and the public within the United States with reference to formulating, adopting, or changing the domestic policies of the United States. Yet neither New Magellan Ventures nor any of the Texas Central entities or their representatives have ever registered with the Department of Justice under the Foreign Agents Registration Act of 1938. So with that laid out for you, I have two questions. Do you agree that it would be concerning if a private company or principals of a private company over the course of a decade failed to register as Ford agents under FARA if the facts are clear that they were legally required to? Well, if you put me in that exact box, uh, the answer has to be yes. Okay. I obviously don't know anything about this matter at all. Um, but Fair enough. obviously, if someone is required to f register under FARA, then we would be concerned if they don't. As I said, I, I want, I'm not surprised that you haven't heard of this, uh, but it's important in our district. And mm -hmm. so uh, I'm, I'm going to the big man on campus to ask those questions. The mm -hmm. final question is, I'll wrap it up. If a private company whose principals fail to register as a foreign agent when the facts are clear that they were required to do so, enters into a partnership with the federal government, would that concern you as the chief law enforcement officer of the United States? And would that cause you to question whether the federal government is properly using taxpayer dollars? Uh, this is less of a clean hypothetical than, than the previous one. I'd have to know a lot more about the facts uh, before I could make a determination. But if those were the facts, hypothetically. Well, that description is, a li even with those facts, is still a little more vague than, uh, than makes clear. Uh, um, uh, FARA is a complicated statute. Um, um, we would always be concerned about uh, an effort by a foreign government uh, to try to influence um, the government of the United States. If I can okay. put it at that level of generality, that's clearly true. And, and I, you know, I understand that, and, I, and you're, you're you obviously have to be somewhat uh, uh, obtuse about that, but so to I'd summarize, rather call it circumspect. If, yeah, okay, <laughs> in Texas, there is a so-called private company that has no board of directors that has now gotten eminent domain from the state of Texas to take private citizens' land and gotten a grant from Amtrak to take people's land and build a project that currently doesn't exist, and they haven't reg on behalf of a foreign government, and they haven't registered as federal agents. So thank you for your time. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Mrs. Ming. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Cartwright. Uh, thank you, Attorney General Garland. I wanted to ask about uh, a bill of mine that was signed into law in 2021, the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act, which directs the Attorney General to provide guidance to state and local law enforcement agencies to bolster reporting of hate crimes. 
I was glad to see that the President's budget request for fiscal year 25 requests $10 million for community-based approaches to prevent and address hate crimes, a grant program that I authored in fiscal year 2022. I want to take this opportunity to thank you for your leadership in responding to violent crime and specifically hate crimes in the U.S. in the last several years. It means a great deal to Asian Americans and so many historically underserved communities to have a president and an attorney general who cares deeply about these issues. I wanted to ask a question that I also asked FBI Director Christopher Wray in last week's hearing. I'm concerned by the trend of a decrease in the number of local law enforcement agencies providing the FBI with incident data. This is the fifth year in a row that the number of local agencies providing data to the FBI has declined. I know that the decline may partially be due to the transition that agencies are making to the NIBRS uh, system, but what additional resources does the DOJ need to support local and state law enforcement agencies using NIBRS? Um, and I'd like to also hear more from you about other ways that the DOJ is actively working to support local law enforcement agencies um, in reporting hate crimes. Yeah, well, thank you for the question, and um, this is a high priority for us. I, I do think that, as the FBI director suggested, that much of the problem is the, just a transition problem from one form of statistical uh, compilation to another. Um, but of course, all of our information has to come from um, um, state uh, and local uh, um, uh, communities. Um, and so what we have to do is reach out to them constantly to ensure that they are providing the numbers. The FBI uh, and our Office of Justice Programs and Bureau of Justice Assistance have sort of identified the places that have been less compliant than they should be and are trying to reach out um, to encourage uh, that level of, of compliance. I think the money we have in the budget is sufficient um, for those kind of uh, reach out programs. Um, um, but I, we won't be satisfied until all the crimes are reported. Thank you. And just to follow up, as you've said, state and local law enforcement agencies play a crucial role in the nationwide response to hate crimes. But I also want to make sure to ask about how the DOJ works with community-based organizations, which also have a crucial part in building up community resilience and preventing uh, future hate crimes. Can you talk about how the DOJ is coordinating with both law enforcement and uh, local organizations to respond to hate crime? Yeah, so uh, each of our U.S. Attorney's offices uh, has a civil rights and hate crimes coordinator, um, and each of the U.S. Attorneys uh, has been instructed to reach out to the communities um, to, um, to have discussions well in advance of any crisis occurring. Um, you know, our, our, our strategy here is to develop trust within communities before uh, something bad happens so that if something bad happens, uh, the community uh, trusts law enforcement. These are joint meetings of uh, the U.S. Attorney's offices and our various law enforcement components. As I know you know well, we have a United Against Hate campaign uh, uh, that the uh, U.S. Attorney's offices are um, implementing and have been implementing for the past couple of years to reach out to communities in just the way uh, that you said, uh, so that um, um, uh, law federal law enforcement, state and local law enforcement, and communities um, uh, can uh, 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 cooperate and work together. I've attended uh, one of those meetings in uh, Denver. Um, and I've uh, attended a couple of other meetings of uh, community outreach in other places, including in St. Louis. Thank you so much. And I'll quickly ask about uh, <clears throat> another question about the aftermath of the China initiative. As we all know, in February 2022, uh, the end of the China initiative was announced. Um, and previously, an accept unacceptably high number of these cases ended in drop charges, dismissals, and acquittals because prosecutors could not prove allegations. Um, Chinese American researchers and scholars who made valuable contributions in so many fields in this country for decades reported feeling targeted by a racial profiling campaign. Um, I want to be clear, as a member of the subcommittee, I am fully supportive of the DOJ's real and necessary work to combat espionage by adversarial governments. Um, but just want to make sure, how does the DOJ ensure that agents working on these investigations 
Number one, avoid wasteful investigations into legitimate academic research. Uh, and, and second, how is the DOJ also educating the institutions themselves uh, and the public about the real national security threats and how they can best defend themselves and our country uh, from these threats? So, um, uh, as you pointed out, we now have a uh, consolidated um, uh, section in, in the National Security Division uh, to address um, uh, the threats uh, posed by the People's Republic of China, uh, Russia, um, 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 North Korea, and Iran, uh, focusing on our attention, our attention on all the myriad ways in which these uh, adversaries um, uh, attempt to uh, either um, um, attack us from a cyber point of view, uh, um, uh, prevent um, uh, present efforts uh, to um, harass dissidents uh, in the United States, um, steal our uh, uh, personal identifying information and our um, um, uh, uh, technology. Um, so to take that the latter part of your question first, that, that's the way in which we're, we're doing that. And then each U.S. Attorney's Office has a national security coordinator, and the FBI has joint terrorism task forces in each of its uh, 54 districts. As to the more general question, um, we have a robust uh, review process. Um, all national security cases um, have to touch base with the National Security Division. Uh, which can review to uh, ensure that the principles of federal prosecution, which determine which kinds of prosecution should be brought, which kinds uh, shouldn't, are done. I want to emphasize that uh, we do not prosecute uh, based on the ethnicity uh, of any person. We are only looking at to prosecute uh, uh, people who are working for our adversaries in an effort uh, to injure the United States. Um, but that is not in any way um, a part of the ethnicity of, 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 uh, of, of people in the United States. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. That concludes the first round of uh, questions. Uh, I know the general needs to be through here by 12 noon, so we have a few minutes to go. Is there... A desire by members for a second round two down here. All right, General, if that's agreeable with you. I'm happy to be here for the We'll get you out of here by noon. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Mr. Garcia, do you desire time? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Three minutes. Thank you, sir. Uh, and Attorney General, I want to follow up on the assertions uh, made my colleagues from Pennsylvania and New York uh, that, that I was engaging in personal attack. I take great pride and, frankly, great caution in making sure I don't engage in personal attack in these hearings. I want you to know that my assessment of you, uh, as appalled, as shocked as I was of you giving yourself an A, was not meant to be a personal attack. It was a professional one. Uh, as my chemistry teacher who gave me an F in my midterm at the Naval Academy told me, uh, this is to help you get better. Um, so I do that in the interest of uh, accountability and, and frank, frank and objective uh, assessments, uh, not personal attacks. I, I know someone of your caliber was not personally offended by that, uh, and I'm happy to have conversations offline. I want to follow up on Mr. Klein's uh, conversation around the HER report. Um, you, first of all, on, in your written testimony on page three, you say there is not one set of laws for powerful and another for powerless, one for rich, another for poor, one for Democrats, one for Republicans, or different rules depending upon one's race or ethnicity or religion. Uh, you, you would say that that's probably true for age, right? Anyone over the age of 18, regardless, uh, unless there is a cognitive impairment, should be treated the same, and there's one set of laws regardless of age. Without, without addressing the uh, hidden premise beside, behind your question, I'm just going to say there is one tier standard of uh, justice. Um, we prosecute under the Prince federal principles of, of prosecution, um, and uh, we do not um, um, distinguish uh, based on politics, uh, um, um, based on ethnicity, based on ideology, based on race, uh, or any non-meritorious factor or seniors who are protected class in a, in a workplace, obviously, as well. Anyone over the age of a certain, I think it's 55 or 65. Uh, you also, in your, testi your verbal testimony, say you have no doubt uh, uh, that there is no cognitive impairment of the president. 
You said the her report speaks for itself, and I have complete confidence in the President of the United States. Um, and so my question is, and, and I sit on the Intel Committee, so I have seen the classified documents, uh, and I'm aware uh, of the nature of, of at least some of these documents. Uh, they are of the highest level of national security intelligence, and they are extremely relevant even today. These documents that were found in the garage of President Biden. Um, and so if it's, if it's not a, a, a cognitive impairment problem, if, it's, if, it's, uh, if he's competent and, and you're confident in that, why, why is he not being charged for? And in his testimony or in his special counsel report, her said he willfully detained and disclosed sensitive classified information. So what is the explanation for not charging uh, President Biden for mishandling of classified Look, uh, documents? I'll, I'll, I'll address both questions again. Um, I have complete confidence in the, in the president um, uh, in every possible respect. On the uh, question of why uh, there were no charges, Mr. Herr described in detail in his report his explanation for why he decided not to bring them. He was subject to some five hours of testimony on that but subject. But you, you disagreed with the foundational premise of his assertions, which is the, the rationale was that he was cognitively, cognitively incapable of understanding what he was doing. He was too old to face charges. And you disagreed with that premise, right? I'm going to say two things. First, that is not at all what Mr. Hurst said. And I urge everyone to read again what yeah. he said. He did not say anything like that. But second, Mr. Hur described his explanation for why not to bring a case and uh, bring this case, and he distinguished other cases involving classified information where charges were brought. And I just refer you to that. Okay, I'll go reread re it, and uh, we'll submit questions for the record. I believe my uh, time is up. Thank you, Attorney General. Mr. Carlyle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Attorney General, in 2023, the CDC reported that over a recent 12-month period, more than 112,000 Americans died as a result of drug overdoses or poisonings, and we've touched on that subject earlier in this hearing. DEA was one of the few agencies that saw a funding increase in fiscal year 2024, and the work that the administrator is doing, especially with the U.S. attorneys to go after the cartels and the entire network, is critically important to stemming the flow of illicit fentanyl into our communities, but enforcement is only part of the solution. We also have to have recovery and rehabilitation tools for those with substance abuse disorders as well. Can you talk a little bit about the Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act grants, especially the drug courts and the veterans treatment centers? Yes, yeah, so uh, you are quite right that the, uh, our ability uh, uh, to eliminate uh, drug trafficking uh, and to protect the country includes uh, our concerns about the people who are the victims um, of, of uh, drug trafficking um, and, uh, and the need, of course, to reduce the demand uh, for uh, these poisons in our country. So we've asked for more than $490 million in counter-drug-related uh, Office of Justice Program grants. Um, these include, in particular, the uh, Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act uh, grants, for which we're acquire, uh, requesting $443 million, which is a $23 million uh, addition over the uh, enacted. That, those include the uh, Comprehensive Opioid Stimulant and Substance Abuse Program, the so-called COSAP, pro, COSAP program, the Mental Health and Residential Substance Use Treatment, our drug courts, the drug courts, which we're asking for $94 million, the veterans treatments um, courts, for which we're asking for $33 million, as well as for prescription drug monitoring to ensure that this doesn't get out of hand again. Thank you. And can you give me a sense as to whether you are seeing increases in applications for these important programs you just touched on? I would say that there's always more applications than we have money to, to, um, to give out. That's definitely the case. And in what other ways does your department's fiscal year 2025 budget request seek to address this terrible problem? Well, on, again, on the overdose and addiction side, those, those are the uh, principal um, issues. On the trafficking side, which is uh, unfortunately uh, what causes, in the end, these problems, we've, we're asking for $10.7 billion for all of our law enforcement um, uh, agents and U.S. attorneys um, to respond to this problem. That's a 5.1% increase over enacted FY24. 
Thank you, Attorney General Garland, and thank you for being here today. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Clyde. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Attorney General Garland, uh, my colleague, Congressman Chip Roy, has twice requested a copy of the Freedom of Access to Clinic Entrances Act prosecution data. He first asked for it in October of 2022, and then again two months ago on February the 16th. Um, he has yet to receive this data, and my question to you is, when will this data be provided by the Department of Justice? Um, I, I don't know specifically about the request, but like the other request you asked about, I'm, I'm very happy to look into this. Um, uh, and and provide know. the data. I'm sorry? And provide oh, the of data. Of course, if we have okay, the data. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, in the FBI's request, FY25 request, um, excuse me, in your, in the Department of Justice's budget, you're requesting $437.6 million for protecting civil rights. That's an increase from what I see here. Um, <clears throat> under the civil rights heading in the FBI's uh, request, it says color of law violations are actions taken by any person using the authority given to them by a government agency to willfully deprive someone of a right. Now, since you've been attorney general, has anyone in the government or otherwise been prosecuted for a color of law violation for denying people their Second Amendment rights? That's a civil right. Uh, I understand that. I don't know the answer to that. But, um, um, I, and I have not heard that there has been that kind of prosecution. Okay. Well, since the SCOTUS decision overturning the New York law, um, which was the New York Rifle and Pistol Association versus Bruin, which denied New Yorkers their constitutional rights, I would think that there would be a case there. So I would ask the Department of Justice to look into that because the Second Amendment is a civil right. And when people are denied that civil right, then I think under the Civil Rights Division, the D Department of Justice should engage. Now also, um, in last year's congressional hearing, I asked about your department's most recent congressional authorization. Uh, has your department been reauthorized or is the most recent authorization the one that expired in FY 2009? I will say you taught me something about authorizations and appropriations at the last hearing that I did not know. Um, my understanding is that that was the last authorization, the one you're talking about. Uh, of course, the Justice Department would always like to uh, uh, have an authorization. My understanding is that the uh, yearly appropriations um, uh, count as authorizations, but of course, it would always be better uh, for any uh, entity to be uh, have the, uh, a formal authorization. Well, we're not an authorizing committee. We are an appropriating committee. It's the it's the um, judiciary committee that is the authorizing oh, committee that. for Department of Justice. Um, so DOJ remains unauthorized, and you're running an, auth an unauthorized agency by the department. Or excuse me, by the um, the judiciary committee. So, um, are you going to seek a new congressional authorization? from the Judiciary Committee? Um, I haven't had those kind of discussions. Um, I'll be happy to take that back and think about it. I don't, again, given the appropriations, um, I've been advised that that's not required, but I'll uh, be happy to think about it some more. <laughs> okay, thank you, and I yield back. Mr. Morelli. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, uh, Mr. Attorney General, I've written to your office in the past about the importance of prioritizing federal prosecutions of firearms cases and pleased to see the success of the Guns Involved Violence Elimination Initiative uh, operating at the U.S. Attorneys in the Western District Office of New York. Uh, I'd like to just ask if I can follow up with staff uh, after the meeting to ensure we have sufficient resources to continue the Western New York Initiative. Uh, yes. Um, 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 I can talk about uh, a few a few things in uh, that regard, but um, I, I think it, uh, you are correct that our uh, work in the Western District of New York is ongoing and has been successful, uh, and then we have the uh, money that we need uh, for that purpose. Terrific. Thank you, sir. Uh, and then I'll just ask uh, one other question. Last week, I was uh, very pleased to see the department finalize a new rule to update the definition of engaged in business as a firearms dealer. Uh, as you know, unlicensed dealers who do not uh, conduct background checks are the largest source of firearms that are illegally brought into our communities. And uh, if you could just talk about the budgetary impact on uh, that requirement uh, by firearms dealers and the ability for the department to uh, uh, to con make sure that uh, that new rule is, uh, is, is carried out. Yeah, so this is uh, the implementation of the Bipartisan Safer <laughs> Communities Act, and we've asked for money in the um, ATF budget uh, for uh, for that purpose. 
Um, I, the money that we've asked for should be sufficient um, uh, for that rule and for the other work uh, that ATF does. Terrific. Thank you. I'll uh, yield back, Mr. Chair. Mr. Klein. Uh, the, the gentleman and I have similar questions today. Uh, and, oh, by the way, uh, let's work on that reauthorization. I'll send over a proposal. I may have a few changes to propose in that reauth. <laughs> um, but uh, Maybe that's a good idea for us not to be thinking about that. <laughs> um, given that ATF claims it can barely keep up with the workload of inspecting the current number of licensed dealers, uh, what is the point of this new rule? Is it actually to encourage firearm sellers to become licensed or to discourage them from engaging in the constitutionally protected activity of selling and trading in firearms at all? The purpose of the new rule is to implement the definitional change uh, brought by the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, uh, which uh, changed the definition of being engaged in the business from engaged in the business for the purpose of uh, maintaining a livelihood uh, to um, 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 being engaged in the business uh, for the predominant purpose of earning a profit. Uh, with that change, it required uh, regulations explaining what that means. Okay. The purpose is to prevent guns from being sold to prohibited persons uh, without a background check to be sure that a uh, prohibited person doesn't get a gun. That includes a, for, uh, somebody who served time as a violent felon, for example. Okay. Uh, the rule also institutes a series of rebuttable presumptions to supposedly clarify when the licensing requirement attaches to gun sales, but these presumptions appear nowhere in statute uh, to the degree that they have any legal foundation at all. Uh, they're said to interpret the old, not the currently existing language on who is a dealer. And it, the rule itself estimates that tens of thousands of firearm sellers will be required to become licensed dealers under its terms, which would obviously necessitate a significant increase in ATF oversight as well. Did ATF coordinate with the FBI or seek their input on the capacity of NICS, uh, the background check system, to absorb the additional workload this rule would create? It seems to have, that it would have a cascading effect on, on a variety of departments and divisions and their workload. Yeah, I, I believe that the, um, uh, the department's regulation discusses um, workload impact. I don't know the answer to the specific question you're asking, and I'll, I'll try to get uh, have somebody get back to you on that specific question. Uh, and, and I would just express concern that this seems to be um, an, an end run uh, around the authority of Congress to set the laws uh, rather than uh, the department and uh, especially when it comes to the constitutionally protected rights of American citizens to keep and bear arms, I, I think uh, your actions are uh, headed in the wrong direction. So, right. Just to be clear, this is really not about the Second Amendment in any respect. It's about implementing Congress's uh, statute and uh, the prohibitions on selling guns to people uh, who Congress has said should not have them. It's not you, about when the you, when you otherwise. keep and bear arms, you have to uh, purchase and sell and that, that's part of keeping and bearing arms. So I would just urge you to keep that in mind. I yield back. Mr. Tron. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, last year, we helped pass the Bipartisan Law Enforcement De-Escalation Training Act, which provides $124 million in grant funding over four years on de-escalation training for police officers. This is going to save lives, and improve police-community relations. Although this program is new, could you talk briefly about its implementation and more broadly how DOJ's budget prioritizes mental health and crisis stabilization? Yeah, I, I don't have the specifics with respect to that program, but as a general matter, um, our COPS office uh, and our Office of Justice Programs provides de-escalation, money for de-escalation training. It is an important way to protect the lives of uh, uh, officers and first respondents, as well as the people who are uh, calling for help. Um, you are also right in the implication of your questions that many of these calls involve people who um, are mentally ill or have mental impairment, um, and that the sensitivity of respondents um, to that uh, possibility uh, as an important element of, uh, of, the, of the need for de-escalation. Thank you for your efforts there. 70 to 100 million Americans have criminal records and that appear on routine background checks, often preventing them from getting jobs. Um, over the last seven years, my company has hired about 1,400 uh, returning citizens, which is good for business and cuts down recidivism. State-passed clean slate 
automatic clearing records. Uh, these type of efforts are costly and have been a barrier to widespread adoption. What resources the DOJ need to help support these clean slate laws? Well, I don't think I'm, I'm going to be able to, to talk to you specifically about the clean slate laws. Um, you know, in the area of uh, criminal justice reform, um, in the implementation of the um, uh, Second Chance Act, which involves uh, reentry programs, um, uh, we're asking for $125 million uh, for those reentry programs. Um, in addition, there is a, a, a new program called the Accelerating Justice System Reform Grants which is a $300 million request for FY25 uh, um, and uh, $15 billion over 10 years. I'm not sure exactly whether the clean slate would fall within those, but um, I'll ask my staff to get back to you on which of the grant programs uh, go to the program you're talking yeah, We'd love to keep working with you. Last quick question to build on uh, Ranking Member DeLauro on the Antitrust Division. Mm -hmm. uh, should this committee take another look at the language uh, that... Uh, eliminates, stops you from having full access to the merger filing fees and locks you into that $233 million? Uh, well, I'm going to leave it to the, uh, uh, to the members of Congress to uh, um, uh, resolve this question. The uh, Justice Department is in favor of, of the uh, antitrust division getting the full access to the fees. Um, <laughs> But, um, you know, in the end, um, the Congress uh, makes those determinations. Seems like a good idea. It Thank you. It does seem like a good idea, yes. You'll back. That concludes uh, the hearing. May I have just one quick... Um, the gentleman's recognized. I, I know we're seven years into the consent degree with respect to Baltimore, mm -hmm. uh, and that we, we, we've reached compliance with two. Uh, and you don't have to give that unless you have it here right, right away, but give me an update on what's left and how we're doing. And if you could have somebody from your staff get back to my office about that, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, I can just give you a little okay. idea now, and then I'll have, I'll have happy to get more detail back to you. Uh, so we do think that the Baltimore Police Department has made substantial progress towards satisfying the key provisions of the consent decree. And in January of this year, uh, we filed a joint motion to declare the city and the uh, Baltimore Police Department in full and effective compliance on three points, the safe transportation of people in custody, officer assistance and support, and ensuring health and well-being of BPD employees. The court granted that motion, and um, now um, BPD has to sustain a record of success in these areas for one year, and then those provisions will be, determina will be terminated. Uh, the department continues to work with uh, the police department on compliance with the other parts of the consent decree, uh, in particular, these include uh, use of force, uh, use of lethal force, use of force, uh, stop, seizures, and arrests. But this is good progress. Yeah, and well, thank you, sir. You don't have to get back to me. Okay, thank you. That concludes today's hearing. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank our witness, Attorney General Garland, for being very generous with his time uh, and being open and frank in his testimony. Without objection, members may have seven days to submit additional questions for the record. The committee stands adjourned.